You will find him and you will burn his books. You will arrest him and bring him to me. Would God that I had my hands on Tyndall's scrawny neck. I shall take up my pen against Tyndale for the glory of God and his church. And I'll not take a penny for it. These were the mightiest men in England in the 1520s. But who was this William Tyndale that these powerful men were after? Why was it so important that he be caught? What had he done that made them so afraid? William Tyndale was a smuggler, but what was he smuggling? Weapons or drugs? No, Tyndale was smuggling the Bible, the Bible in English. And for that, he was on the top of the most wanted list. In England in the 1520s, there were not many churches and denominations such as we have today. There was only one church, and that was the Roman Catholic Church, and that was a very powerful church. Next to King Henry VIII, the most powerful man in all of England was Cardinal Wolsey. This is Cardinal Wolsey's palace. Although he was brought up from rather humble origins, the son of a butcher, Wolsey rose through the ranks to become Lord Chancellor of England and the Pope's personal representative to England. He began to build this opulent Hampton Court Palace in 1515. 2,500 workers were needed to build it. There are over a thousand rooms. After it was built, 500 were needed to staff it. The Cardinal's Palace still stands now almost 500 years later as a vivid reminder of the position and power of the church in those days. Such a church did not easily tolerate troublemakers, nor those who in any way challenged its authority. An incident at Coventry in April of 1519 is hard for us to believe today, but it gives us an idea of the circumstances that prevailed in Tyndale's time. Speak. Child, show us your great learning. You have nothing to fear but God's wrath, my little one. So speak. Our Father. Yes. There is more. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, as in heaven, so on earth. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone else in the world. Enough! I most solemnly forbid you, child, ever again to speak the creed, the Lord's Prayer, or the Ten Commandments in English. We need hear no more. The men will burn. But of our great compassion and mercy, the widow will be spared to provide for this brood after we have taught them afresh the godly ways of the church. See, she is safe home, Morton. Take the rest away. It was in such a religious climate that young William Tyndale came here to Little Sudbury Manor to become the tutor to the children of Sir John Walsh. Sir John had been a lifelong friend of King Henry VIII. Tyndale had completed his studies at Oxford and Cambridge, and when he came here, he was a young man with fire burning in his soul. We'll talk about that inside. Tyndale was driven to work for reform because he saw a church corrupted by power and the common people steeped in ignorance and superstition. What particularly grieved him was the fact they had no Bible in their own English language. Tyndale wanted more than anything else in the world to use his remarkable linguistic gifts, for here was a man who had already mastered seven languages, to use these gifts to translate the Bible into English out of the original languages, the Hebrew and the Greek. There was a memorable occasion in this very room when Tyndale sat at table with a group of people, including several priests, 
These priests had no interest in the scriptures, so Tyndale railed at them. If God spares my life, I will see to it that even the plowboy shall have a greater knowledge of the scriptures than you do. This is the very room where Tyndale began his Bible translation activities. Now, remember, it was only a century and a half earlier in England that John Wycliffe had tried to bring a Bible translation in the English language to the people. His movement was thought to be associated with the Peasants' Revolt, so they were violently suppressed. Now, in Tyndale's time, something else was happening. Martin Luther's teachings were spreading all over Europe and coming here to England as well. So the church authorities were very cautious and very defensive. It was all right for Tyndale to sit here and translate all he wanted, but if his work were to get out, it had to be published. To be published, he had to have approval from someone in authority in the church. Tyndale looked around and he saw there was one who might help. That was the Bishop of London, Cuthbert Tunstall. He was a recognized Greek scholar. Tyndale thought he'll surely understand, and he went to him for his help. Tell me, if you were to be found in my employ, what work of translation would you undertake? That, mm -hmm. of, that of the Testament, Your Grace, from Greek to English. And for that, you would require my patronage, my Episcopal authority. Yes, Your Grace. Yes. Hmm. A worthy work. Not every priest has the same gift for language as you and I. And most would profit from an understanding of the scriptures. I would wish that the testament be read by everyone, and not by the clergy only. In time, perhaps. In time. Consider the seasons, young Tyndale. How they change. Winter turns into summer slowly, through the many shades of spring. The people are hungry for the word of truth now. That same word of truth declares that meat is not for babes, but for those who are strong enough to bear it. When the church has grown to manhood, then shall we feed them. If Tunstall wouldn't back Tyndale, then there was very little hope that any other church authority in England would. But there had to be a way, and there was. Tyndale found it on the London docks beside the Thames River. If he could not get the help of the church authorities, then maybe it would be committed laypersons who would pave the way. We are many, but careful. That man there, what do you see? A man with the strength of an ox and the faith of a little child. Harry! Thomas talks of your purposes, of your learning in Greek, that you would give the scriptures to Englishmen. If God wills. Would God will that his word be not read? <laughs> Whitcliffe translated the scriptures, but few in England have them. Perhaps God would have us hunger for his word before he feeds us. The people are hungry now. Look. Luther, it is good, it is precious, and the word is in it, but it is not the word. Too many books come to England, like this. Secretly, I, by the score. But I say again, we are careful. Men have burned for less. Message, sir. So in 1524, when he was about 30 years old, come. Tyndale went to Germany to pursue his translation work and to find a printer to make the many copies needed to spread throughout England. Perhaps now the people are hungry enough. <laughs> After arriving on the continent, Tyndale looked back to England. He longed for the day when he might return to his own people and to spread the word himself. It's common to all the congregation who believe in Christ. Tyndale worked tirelessly and completed his translation of the New Testament. He had it printed at Cologne in Germany in 1525. Copies were smuggled into England. When they found out, 
Both church and state were enraged. Suddenly we'll see, suddenly, not subtly or insidiously, but suddenly we have the scriptures in English everywhere. Suddenly we'll see, we have a rage of bishops. Suddenly we'll see, we hear of the world's end. And I am not told of it. Why? Is it because I am only the king? Is my majesty so light a thing? Who is William Tyndale? Some low-born priest, sir. Ah, and is this the same low-born priest of whom my ambassador to Spain warned me 12 months since? Yes. And is this the same low-born priest who it is said had undertaken to translate the whole of scripture? The same. And where is my command that he be found and stopped? I have men, even now, in France and Germany and Flanders, who have not paused in their search for him without success. He bolts from place to place. Oh, printing the scriptures on the back of a traveling mule, perhaps. Hey, Thomas? Ah! <laughs> it is not a subject for jest, sir. You would tell me it is no jest. What blind, half-witted man have you commissioned to make the search? John Hackett. Oh, John Hackett! And where has John Hackett looked? Wherever Tyndale has been sighted or word of him reported. Hamburg, Cologne, Worms, Marburg, even Wittenberg. Wittenberg? Yes! He's in league with Luther. Without question. Then he's indeed a heretic. You will find him and you will burn his books. You will arrest him and bring him to me. Come, Thomas, I want to talk to you. A bitter opponent of the reformers in Germany, John Cochleus, learned of Tyndale's work. He wasted no time reporting this discovery to Hermann Rinke, a senator of Cologne in Germany and a friend of King Henry VIII of England. I have an mother and a small niece still in Frankfurt. You need not fear for them. This is Cologne, Herr Cochleus. We have been spared the Lutheran madness. And so long as there's breath in my body, so shall we be. Now tell me, what is this that you have learned? Two Englishmen are here in this city. This is the work on which they are engaged. Fine craftsmanship. What is it? It is a letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. I found this sample in the printing works of Peter Quintel. By chance? By chance, I spoke with certain employees of Herr Quintel, and one, with a little too much wine, was indiscreet. How indiscreet? He said that, whether the King and Cardinal of York wish it or not, all England will soon be Lutheran. England? Never! He said that soon, every Englishman will have the scriptures in their native tongue, and they will have them from Cologne. That they will not! Where is this printing works of Peter Quintel? Well, a minute's only to be gone. Away from here. Yeah, what's that? They have found us. Hurry, we must go. Who has found us? Herman Rinker. And who has betrayed us? It matters not. But, but the books, the, the manuscripts, they must go to the printer. I have all we need. Hurry! They are at the very doors. Please, outside, under the sacks. And you, do the same with those. And hurry, please, there isn't very much time. There is no time at all here, Quintel. Please, leave everything as it is. So, Herr Quintel, who commissioned this, this perfidious work? Herr Quintel, is not the loss of your trade enough? Would you also lose your liberty? Perhaps, perhaps your life. His name is William Tyndale. William Tyndale. 
Tyndale continued on the run as a fugitive, but even under such constant pressure, he just went about his work. And he was aided by a most unlikely source. The Archbishop of Canterbury, anxious to stop the spread of Tyndale's translations, bought up all the copies so he could burn them. That income enabled Tyndale to finance a new and better revised edition. So now, ironically, Tyndale's enemies were actually financing his work. In addition to translating the Bible, Tyndale wrote other books, including his famous The Obedience of the Christian Man. His works continued to be smuggled into England. They reached a wide and diverse audience from commoners to Queen Anne Boleyn. His works vigorously fanned the growing interest in church reform in England. This is Tyndale's 1526 New Testament. It would become the basis for the Bible in English for centuries to come. The authorities intensified their efforts to stop Tyndale, and a particularly slimy character by the name of Henry Phillips was recruited to go after him. Phillips came from a distinguished family. His father served in Parliament, but young Henry had gambled away his family's money and got himself into a lot of trouble. He was suave, he was sneaky, he was there to be used. You know who I am? Yes, Your Grace, you are Stokesley, Bishop of London. And what do you know of me? <laughs> that you are wise and charitable. Do not and lie I... to me, you know no such thing. Tunstall was wise and charitable, kind and good. I am wise. Charity is something I use sparingly and not on rogues like you. No, Your Grace. Now I shall recount such that I know of you. You are Henry Phillips, thief, liar, a villain, and a reproach to your father. Now, tell me what common ground is there between us? There can be none, Your Grace, between a rogue such as I and your good self. Oh, you fawning, pitiful creature. I shall tell you. What think you of these? The obedience of the Christian man, practice of prelates, parable of the wicked mammon, the New Testament in English. They are to be despised, Your Grace. And their author? He should be put to the flames and burnt. There. We have common ground between us. Tell me. Why do you think does William Tyndale yet live and work and infect this happy island with his poison? Because he is crafty and conceals himself well. So then, his capture requires a man of equal craftiness. Yes, Your Grace. Such a man are you. You will find him, arrest him, and bring him to me. But Your Grace... Or I shall find for you the darkest, coldest, wettest cell in all London, and that is where you will end your day. Yes, Your Grace. Phillips went to work. He discovered that Tyndale had gone to Antwerp in Holland. He went there and found Tyndale. The ever-trusting Tyndale was easily taken in. Phillips even dined with him at the house of the English merchant, Thomas Points, where Tyndale was staying. Phillips set up his plan with the imperial court of the emperor in Brussels, Belgium, some 24 miles away. Then Phillips arranged to have lunch with Tyndale. It was May 1535. Tyndale had been on the run for over 10 years. It is he who does the work if we would but let him. And so we have earned our bread. William, I, I think I've been robbed. Robbed, Harry? Huh? Where? Well, I don't know, but I, it doesn't matter. I carried only a few shillings. <laughs> Except I was to buy you a meal. Mm, I have money. I will buy the meal. Oh, God forbid. It was my invitation. Yeah. But perhaps you'll lend me the money I've lost. <laughs> yeah. Harry. <laughs> <laughs> I will repay you as soon as we return. When you can, Harry. When you can. <laughs> I'm doubly indebted to you, William. <laughs> Yes. 
This is the man. Take him away. William Tyndale, the King of England has somewhat against you for crimes committed in that realm. These do not concern us. You have been arrested and stand charged with heresy. In that, first, you maintain that faith alone justifies. Second, you maintain that to believe in the forgiveness of sins and to embrace the mercy offered in the gospel is enough for salvation. Third, you aver that the traditions of men cannot bind the soul. Fourth, you affirm that neither the Virgin nor the saints pray for us in their own person. And fifth, you assert that neither the Virgin nor the saints should be invoked by us. How do you answer? I answer thus, with a clear conscience before God and man, that I have never maintained, affirmed, averred or asserted anything contrary to the plain meaning of God's holy scriptures. On these alone, and these alone I stand. Would you say then that faith alone justifies and not works? The fruit that grows on a tree does not make the tree good or bad. It only makes known whether the tree is a good tree or a bad tree. And works do not make a man good or bad. They only make it plain to other men whether he who performs those works is good or bad. A man is reconciled before God by faith alone. And works serve only to make this justification known before men. Such is the contention of the Apostle Paul, as it is written. By grace are you saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I'm in Vilvorda in Belgium. This is the city where Tyndale was tried, and then he was held prisoner in the castle here. His cell was down in the dungeon, cold, small, damp. We have the only existing example of Tyndale's own handwriting in a letter written from his cell here. In it, Tyndale asks for a hat, a coat to get him through the winter, a piece of cloth to patch his leggings. He also wanted a lamp, a Hebrew Bible, dictionary, and grammar. But he would not need any of these. On October 6, 1536, Tyndale was put to death. Witnesses present recall his final words. They remembered and recorded them. They were few in number. It was a simple prayer. Lord, open the King of England's eyes. <coughs> When Tyndale died, there were already two Bibles circulating in England. 
each effectively contained Tyndale's translation of the New Testament, and much of his work had been used for the Old Testament. When one of them, Coverdale's version, was presented to Henry VIII, he was assured by the bishops that they could find no errors in it. Then, if there be no heresies in it, then in God's name, let it go abroad among the people. The following year, His Majesty authorized a small phrase of immense significance to be added to the title page of the English Bible. Set forth with the King's most gracious license. On September the 5th, 1538, Henry ordered every church in England to display one book of the whole Bible of the largest volume in English. The whole Bible, printed in English, was at the heart of the Reformation in England. It remains as a memorial to William Tyndale and an answer to his dying prayer.